What's up everybody, Alex here, and welcome to the Dota Underlords Best Builds of the Week, the weekly series where I show you guys top 5 meta builds to help you rank up in Dota Underlords. Now this week we are starting with the best build of the current meta, and that is 6 Fallen with Heartless Hunters. And I like this positioning here mainly because what you're going to do here is you are protecting an Essex with the pull from Marana. You can uh, run Wind Ranger early, but you definitely want Enthrall and Essex for this build. You have a ton of ranged units here that generally uh, benefit from uh, the Essex. This positioning allows any Pudge to pull the, uh, the Marana first, and and also, the little archer from an Essex does get the benefit of the drow. Bear in mind, a lot of people might not realize this, but Vengeful Spirit's uh, attack range is only two cells. So you want to put her in, a, in an area, because if you put her back here, she's going to have to step forward anyway. Uh, you could switch it like this here and have them kind of, because uh, the Death Prophet has a three attack range. However, the realistic truth is that you want Exorcism to affect the, the, the three cells on the board. So you're probably going to want to position like this and have Annie's archer there. But overall, this build is absolutely incredible. Uh, the win condition is getting to 6 Fallen. Bear that in mind that in order to get to 6 Fallen and have that cascading damage effect, you need to acquire this guy right here, Wraith King. So you have to be at at least level 8 in order for this build to be effective. Realistically, you're going to be getting to 9 and uh, to complete the build. But realistically, what you also are looking to do, you're looking at 3-star Abaddon and specifically Terrorblade. I've seen a lot of players running this build kind of get baited into trying to 3-star Avenger or Lich. And, I mean, if, if like... RNG gifts it to you, then fine, but you do not want to be hard re-rolling for these units because you need to focus on leveling for that Wraith King. This is your power spike. The six Fallen is your power spike. So realistically, you can level for Abaddon and, uh, and Terra Blade, roll at seven and eight, and find yourself in a situation where perhaps you can uh, three-star one of the two, and that could be a win condition as well. But overall, this is a leveling-based build. Do not get baited into uh, re-rolling hard for these uh, these three stars. Keep in mind, watch contention. But overall, right, you want to be uh, you want to be leveling, and uh, you want to be targeting Terrorblade for a three-star uh, three-star unit, and of course, pulling that Wraith King at level eight and above. Let's talk about build number two. And the second build of the week is bringing us back to the good old beta days where trolls, healers, and knights were part of the meta and a key component as well. Now this build lacks straight up DPS. The only way you truly activate your DPS is through Luna and Troll Warlord. When it lacks in DPS, it makes up for straight up sustained healing potential, okay? You got four healers and you have multiple Paladin Swords, which I do recommend by the way. Paladin Swords, the healing based on my testing at the time of recording in freestyle mode, are additive. So the 20% is added on top of each additional sword, and it can be applied to any unit. So it doesn't have to be a healer with the sword, it can be literally anybody with the sword, and this applies straight across the board. The, um, the way the language is written is a little ambiguous, but that is what testing shows, that these Paladin Swords just straight up increase your healing potential across the entire board, regardless of what unit it's on, by 20%. Now, the nice thing about this build here is that you might be thinking, Alex, two massive matters. What if I three-star Luna? What if I three-star Luna? Of course, Eclipse is great. And if you have a Moon Shard, you want to probably put a Moon Shard on Luna, and you're going to want to have a uh, Mask of Manus on the Troll Warlord. However, because of the four healers, and because of the Paladin Sword, having a three-star Luna with a Mask of Madness is still super good. In fact, I would argue that it's better than a Moon Shard because the healing impact you're going to get from the Mask of Madness is going to outpace the damage potential of Eclipse because at three-star Luna, she's doing a ton of damage and the Mask of Madness lifesteal effect is being amplified by not only the healing bonus but from the Paladin Swords. A lot of extra sustain, and that is what helps you close out a fight. Again, if you want to get that Moon Shard, if you do get a Moon Shard, definitely put it on Luna. Right, Moon Shard for Luna for sure, and you're going to want a Troll Warlord with a Mask of Madness. But if you happen to pick up two Masks, honestly, it's damn good. This build really surprised me. I did like, uh, you know, a healing uh, a healing Underlord, like Healing and Stealing NO. You can even go with uh, Healing Support and Essex. If those fail, you can go with uh, Happy Hour Joel. He really helps to kind of uh, spread out the uh, the healing potential of your uh, your build because basically it makes the opposing team uh, have a really hard time killing in, in any individual unit. So uh, Happy Hour Joel is a great option as well. But overall, I was really surprised with the effect of this, uh, of this build. In fact, I actually ran it in a game, one of my absolute favorite games I've ever played, and when it's ready, when it's released, I'm going to link it up above here, because it was absolutely insane, a must-watch from start to finish. Let's talk about build number three. I said it before, and I'll say it again, shamans are truly remarkable. This build continues to be one of the absolute top builds of the meta, and it's very simple. The shaman alliance is just damn good. 
These black dragons are win conditions, and six shamans are win conditions. Um, the way these builds work is basically the idea is that you level, you pull the six shaman, you add the four savage, and then you finish summoners as you enter into the late game. Once you're at level 10, you can also add a troll warlord in there for the added DPS. But at 9, the build is technically complete. The troll warlord is just, uh, you know, icing on the cake. But realistically here, what you're looking at is a very good build. You want to run someone like, uh, you know, Healing Support in Essex because the Little Archer and the um, and the Golem Droth both benefit from the Savage and the Summoner bonus. With that being said, the Enthralled unit also benefits from it as well. So Annie's an auto pick in this. Enthralled's fantastic. Enthralled's just damn good. Always take Enthralled if you have the option. But either way, Annie's the pick for this build. And what you're going to want to do is you want to focus on getting these units, uh, you know, into the right spot you can. The thing is, is that Bristleback is also a great unit, especially with the Necromicon. Fantastic uh, situation to put the Necromicon in. Get Bristle back in there. But the realistic truth, I have been finding that Lycan and completing the Summoner bonus is a little better than the Bristleback. But if you have a Bristle and you have a Necromicon, then honestly, there's nothing wrong with taking someone like Lycan out and then putting the Bristle back in. But you will not be able to finish unless you get to 10 and then put the Bristle and the Lycan in. You won't be able to finish Summoners. But overall, this build continues to do an amazing amount of work. The only disadvantage to it is that it is a very straightforward build from like a complexity standpoint. So a lot of people are forcing it. You're going to see games where like three or four people are going shamans, honestly. Uh, so if you're seeing a heavy contention, steer away from it. Get a Maelstrom on one of your other builds and get that win. Let's talk about build number four. So I've been doing a lot of testing with Poisoners, and I have come to the decision that this here might be one of the best implementations of Poisoners currently. Now there's a few things happening here that I really want to kind of spell out. First of all, we are running the uh, the Assassins. Why? Because Assassins just give us a little bit of, uh, you know, that added DPS potential because we have to run Queen anyway. And I think that getting Slark with two stars and a mask, he's an absolute fiend right now. Slark, with the current buff, is truly remarkable, worth running in almost any composition with a Mask of Madness. And of course, you want to run the Bounty Hunter as well for the evasion benefit because, you know, hey, it's there, so why not take it? Uh, I do recommend you go Alchemist mainly because of his Acid Spray, reducing uh, enemy armor and doing damage over time. But of course, you do want to run uh, your, your two trolls as well. You're going to be having the Poisoner effect uh, in this situation. And I also recommend Venomancer early. You can swap out Venomancer for the, uh, for the Viper later in the game, but there's something I want to mention here, and that is Puck. Now, Puck is a really interesting unit, and if he's at three stars, it's even crazier. But Puck, with an Octarine up front, will give you a situation where she's taking lots and lots of damage and just firing off illusionary orbs like crazy. At three stars, especially without the Dragon Alliance, because the phase shift, yes, it prevents damage, but what phase shift does is it prevents your ability to attack at three stars. So if you're able to get Puck to three stars and we have her on the front line, it's like a machine gun, especially with the Octarine. It's like a machine gun of, of basically illusionary orbs, and she will do like 6k damage in like 8 seconds. It's insane, absolutely insane. So Puck on the front line without dragons might actually be super awesome. If you do get Viper, you can put Viper up front, put the uh, the Puck at the back, and give give Puck something like a you know a Scythe of the Vise or a, a Void Stone or something like that. You would take out the uh, Venomancer, give the Void Stone over here, and you know put this wherever it doesn't matter. But uh, probably actually, if you're gonna put it anywhere, you're gonna put it here. But anyways, so what that allows you to do is it allows you to kind of apply the poisoning uh, bonus with the corrosive skin. Uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to have the, the Puck as well. I do recommend both forms of Enno in this build. That helps you to stack the poison. The one thing this build does not have is Heartless. Um, so what you're doing is you're kind of trying to offset the Heartless with the Assassins. So what you lose in Heartless uh, you know, armor reduction damage, you're gaining in the Assassin damage. The reason why I've done this is because right now, Heartless are insanely contested. Insanely. The only, the only alliance contested more is Shamans. So what I've been finding is there's usually, you know, one person is usually running assassins in any given game. But, uh, you know, Queen of Pain, these are units you can easily acquire. And uh, I feel, I, I felt much more consistent with these units as opposed to running the Heartless. Though I think that the Heartless kind of have a higher kind of win potential when pulled off. But overall, if you can get him to 2-3 stars, he easily makes up for it by himself. So Slark by himself can make up the difference for the Heartless of, you know, negative 9, for instance, with two Heartless with running Poison. Because Poison, of course, is physical damage. 
Anyways, a phenomenal build. I've been having a ton of fun with Poisoners. I really like it. Let's talk about build number five. And for the final build of the week, we are all in on Assassins and Voids. I've been working on Assassin Voids because they are, quite frankly, my favorite build. I love Assassins. I always have. I love watching just teams melt under the pressure of Assassins. And what we've got here is we've got a build that does a whole lot of work. Let's talk about it. First of all, Enthrall in Essex. you got a runner. In this build, she does way too much work with that Enthralled unit. You have the ability to really target in on those units, so it's great. I like Kunkka up front. You're getting the Swordsman benefit here from a few uh, few different units. And I run Spectre in this build because Spectre is just damn good. Even with the nerf at uh, you know 4 second uh, Spectral Dagger uh, duration, Spectre still does an incredible amount of work. Now, a major note you got to make here. First of all, uh, you know, if you happen to 3 star someone like PA, PA benefits from the uh, evasion, uh, sorry, the Rogue Alliance. So what you're going to want to do is to add to uh, Phantom Assassin's uh, ability to survive. If you get to a 3 star PA, you're going to want to make sure you run someone like Alchemist. I do like Alchemist of all the, uh, the rogues. The reason for this is because you want to add armor reduction. So Acid Spray is going to create an armor reduction field. And that's going to help your Assassins basically burst down the opposing team. You do not want sustained fights with Assassins. You want to kill them as fast as you can. So the, one, the way you do that is you reduce their armor through Alchemist. You're going to stun them with Kunkka. I do actually like targeting buddy in this build. And you could even reposition if you want. You can do something like this if you wish. Uh, if you want to give... Uh, I would actually do this. Have him come around. At the end of the day, though, I do like targeting buddy. The reason for this is because it, it creates that extra two seconds where your assassins aren't taking DPS. They're not taking any damage. For the most part, the targeting buddy is going to explode. But that's 1,200 damage. That's not on your assassins. And these assassins don't have a lot of health. Basically, this, this targeting buddy gives your Ember Spirit new life. Gives him an opportunity to cast his, uh, his Sleight of Fist, right? So anyways, there's a few core items here, right? Uh, for some reason, I forgot to put them on. But, you know, you're going to want to put Butterfly on, right? Uh, you're going to want to put on Mask for the, um, for the uh, what's it called, uh, the Slark. Butterfly at, uh, so you want to run like a Butterfly with uh, Queen of Pain on a... Uh, on a three star, sorry, on a three star Phantom Assassin, not a Queen of Pain. Uh, Battle Fury is absolutely fantastic as well. You can run Battle Fury on someone like uh, on Ember Spirit. You can also run Battle Fury on the Spectre. Helps to blow up that back line when she dives in there. But realistically, guys, it's a it's a phenomenal build. I've actually had some success running the uh, the Halbert. I got spell right here. There you go. So, Heaven, uh, Heaven's Halbert. I've been running Heaven Halbert on the Spectre in the early parts of the game. It gives her that added survivability to help her get a second Spectral Dagger cast, which is pretty significant. It's an incredible DPS boost, right, for those few seconds. If you're against Shaman, give her Maelstrom. Give her Maelstrom and watch her just melt the entire Shaman team with, uh, you know, with the uh, the lightning from the, the Maelstrom. It's a great item because, uh, again, she, she has a huge burst potential when she does Spectral Dagger, and uh, the Stonehall Pike is great for Spectre as well, because she tends to rack up a lot of kills. But overall, guys, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. These builds are truly fantastic. This meta continues to surprise us, and hopefully, hopefully, we continue to uh, unravel this meta's mysteries. Thank you guys so much for watching, and a very special thank you to all of my wonderful subscribers. Take care, everyone, and have yourselves a wonderful day.